Hey, I'm Andy Stoddard, lead pastor here at St. Matthew's United Methodist Church in Madison. I want to thank you for taking a few minutes to watch this sermon video from Worship Sunday. Uh, we hope that you are blessed by it. We'd love for you to worship with us here at St. Matthew's, either in person at 8.30 or 11 o'clock in the Sanctuary for Traditional Worship, or 11 o'clock in our Hart Hall. Uh, for our contemporary intersection service. Or you can join us online for any of those services as, as well. Thanks for watching this sermon video. We hope that you're blessed by it. Have a great day. And that's kind of where we are in the series. You know, we are looking at ways our church has had to adapt over the past couple of years and ways we're coming back in a new normal. And we're also connecting that to the study we're doing with Nehemiah who was tasked with rebuilding the protective wall around Jerusalem and the, and the challenges that he came across and how we can learn from that as well as, as a church, as a society, as we are getting back to our new normals and the way things are. So today's passage from Nehemiah, I'm going to read from the fourth chapter. It's going to be chapter 4, verses 1 through 5. So I invite you to follow along as the words are on the screen, or if you have your own Bible or Bible app, you can follow along uh, as well as I read. So now when Sambalet heard that we were building the wall, he was angry and greatly enraged, and he mocked the Jews. He said in the presence of associates in the army of Samaria, What are these feeble Jews doing? Will they restore it by themselves? Will they offer sacrifice? Will they finish it in a day? Will they revive the stones out of the heaps of rubbish, burned out, burned ones at that? Tobiah, the Amorite, who was beside him, and he said, That stone wall they are building, any fox is going to go up on it and would break it down. Hear, O God, for we are despised. Turn their taunt backs on their own heads and give them all over as plunder in a land of captivity. Do not cover their guilt and do not let their sins be blotted out from your sight, for they have raged against the builders. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So, opposition, the word opposition, it's a noun. Defined, it is resistance or dissonance expressed in action or argument. Opposition. Now, opposition can take many forms, right? It could be situational opposition, something that you just find yourself in the midst of opposing you, fighting against you. It can be individuals that oppose you, that resist against you. Uh, politically, there's the opposition party. In wars, there's the ar opposition army. There's always opposition and that is basically resistance expressed in action or argument, opposition. Well, there is a story of a boy who overcame poverty as, op as opposition that I, that I enjoy. It is a motivational story. You see, in Chicago in the early 1900s, there was a boy that was born to a, to a family who had a lot of failed business ventures. When this boy was young, his dad decided to buy a newspaper company. And of course, he had a couple of sons, so he put his sons to work delivering the paper for this newspaper company. And it grew a little bit, so this father was able to hire on other people. But what did he do? He paid the other people, but not his sons. Okay? He said, well, I'm paying you by letting you have a roof over your head. So this boy, who was kind of an entrepreneur like his dad, said, you know what, I'm going to pick up some things I can sell on my paper routes so I can make a little extra money along the way. Well, over time, his dad, this is a pattern, would sell the business, start something new. So the dad sold the newspaper company, but the boy decided to keep working for the company for a little while longer, probably because he probably got paid from the new owners. Well, eventually he got old enough to where he was ready to give up the paper route business and joined his father. His father bought a, a jam company, some stock in a jam company. So he started working for his dad in the factories as he got up to middle school age. And as the boy was doing this job, he decided to take some art classes on the side. You know, he said, man, I, I like art, but I'm not always going to probably work in a factory or do a newspaper route. Maybe this can be a new venture for me. So he took some art classes while he was working for his dad in the factories. Then at age 16, he dropped out of school. He dropped out of school because he wanted to go drive an ambulance 
for the Allies in World War I overseas. So he lied about his age, which is a common theme for him. He'd always lie about his age so he can kind of get ahead in life. But he got sick with the flu, okay? And that put him out of commission for a while. And then eventually he was able to go to Europe, to France, and drive the ambulance. While he was there, he decided to put his art skills to use to make a little extra money and started drawing characters of people and got really good at it. Well, when the war was over, he decided to come back to the States. And when he came back to the United States, he worked for a a commercial company that did commercials. And his brother joined him. And on the side, he decided to start a short animated film company called Laughograms. So he worked for this commercial company and did Laughograms on the side, still expanding his art and all of that. Well, eventually, the commercial company closed up, his laughograms went bankrupt, and this guy only had $40 to his name. That was it. Back in poverty like his dad. Always starting something new, failing it, selling it, starting something else, but never quite working out. So he's fitting into the pattern of his dad. Well, his brother, who had a little bit more money than him, bailed him out. And so, again, they decided to go out and start their own filming company as a full-time gig. They created a little cartoon character called Mortimer, and their third cartoon short film was put to music, and it became a success, and it was called Steamboat Willie. And so Steamboat Willie and those films afterwards would eventually earn this guy and his brother an Academy Award. So now he has finally got slingshotted to the big big time again, and he said, you know what, we're going to go for broke. We're going to put everything, all the cards on the table, and we're going to make a full featured animated film. First one of its kind of put it all on the table and go for broke. And they did. It took them three years to make it. Everybody said, this is going to fail. You're going to be a failure back in poverty again. But they were wrong. They were wrong. The critics were wrong. And the film was a huge success in February 1938. Snow White and the Seven Doors went to the theaters and made close to over $250 million in today's money. And then, so there we go. That is the story of Walt Disney and Mortimer, who later became Mickey Mouse, and the Walt Disney Company. You see, Walt Disney had a lot of opposition as a child, being born in a family that never really had a stable life, always changing. And then he himself expressed or I experienced failure and opposition, but yet, eventually, he became a success. And I think many of us in this room have supported Walt Disney in some form or fashion <laughs> by either going to his theme parks or watching the shows that he has. But opposition, resistance or dissonance, expressed in action or argument. It could be a person, it could be a situation, it could be a thing. And when we get to today's passage... And this is why I I like Mr. Michael talking today as well, because it showed you some of the challenges we had as a church that we had to work through. But today's passage of Nehemiah, he is um, coming across some really hard opposition for a couple of these guys in this passage. So I want us to look at that. When you look at the first few verses, the scene opens up here with Nehemiah and Sanballat and Tobiah and their criticism. For those of you who haven't been here in the past previous Sundays, Nehemiah was in Persia with the Persian king, and the Persian king allowed Nehemiah to go back to his homeland to help rebuild it once Nehemiah heard reports of the devastation that was going on there. And so this is Nehemiah traveling back, and he has been tasked and called by God to build a protective wall. And that may not seem important, but back in that day and age, a protective wall around the city would allow it to flourish without it to be plundered. You can never get ahead and rebuild. So it was a crucial piece in that day and age, and Nehemiah was tasked to build it. But there were people there that would resist him. All right? Sambalat heard that we were building the wall, and he was angry and greatly enraged. He mocked the Jews. He said in the presence of his associates and of the army of Samaria... What are these feeble Jews doing? Will they restore it by themselves? Will they offer sacrifice? Will they finish it in a day? Will they revive the stones out of the heaps of rubbish? Burned ones at that? And then Tobiah the Amorite was beside him and said, That stone wall they're they're building, any fox can go up and break it down. 
And so they're criticizing him and criticizing him and criticizing him. These are regional governors of the area that were there before Nehemiah came in. It's important to know when it said Amorites and then the other group was Moabs. Those were people that resisted the Jews, the chosen people, as they were coming into the promised land. So these are not necessarily friends of the Jewish people. But yet they were the regional governors put there by the Persian king. The only reason why Nehemiah was not killed in that moment was because he had the blessing of the Persian king. So the only thing these regional governors can do was criticize them, use their words, criticize them, to slow them up, make them doubt themselves. Because it was not an easy job to rebuild this wall. It's been in, in ruins for over hundreds of years, and the groups have tried before. So no, it's not an easy feat to do this. But Nehemiah was called by God and was criticized along the way as he was trying to build it back. So this opposition here was coming from these individuals. But I think for us, in our own lives, as we look at areas that we have to rebuild in our own lives, as we look at areas that we see we're called to go and do, you will face opposition. This is here to show you that there's going to be opposition in your life whenever you decide to go and do something that's what God is calling you to do, to better the kingdom. At that moment, you put a target on yourself, and the devil will be there to trip you up. Jesus, when he started his ministry, he went to go fast and went to the wilderness. And who was there to meet him at his weakest moment but yet the devil? To oppose him to use his words to trip him, to trick him, to test him, to test God. So there, when Jesus was beginning to begin his ministry, the devil wanted nothing more but to end it there. But yet, Jesus resisted. He resisted because he knew his calling, and with the help of God, he was able to overcome those temptations. You know, right here, Nehemiah going on this hard work of rebuilding the wall, it had been a lot easier for them to be like, you know what, guys, you're right. No one else has been able to do it. I tried. I'm going to go back to being the cupbearer of the Persian king and tasting all the fine foods and wines and sleep in a nice palace and come over here to this wasteland trying to rebuild it. You're right, guys. It would probably been really easy for him to go back to his life doing what he was doing, and he would have lived a comfortable life. But yet... The town would have been left vulnerable for future attacks, looting, and would never would have been rebuilt the way God needed it to be rebuilt. So opposition. It, Jesus was no exception to the rule. Nehemiah was no exception to the rule. We are no exception to the rule as individuals and as a church. As we as individuals go out and live our lives... As we go out and live a life that honors God and brings others closer to him, you will be opposed by the forces of the world. You may not realize it at the time, but it slowly builds. It slowly builds. And so you have to be keenly aware of where the opposition lies and where you need to stand firm. As a church, as this you know, this wall, the symbol of a wall that we're building back, and as the ministries and the things you see on here each one of these pieces of the, of the wall all face their own individual oppositions at times. They're challenges. But yet they keep pushing through because God is calling to them to do so. And with the help of the Holy Spirit, they will overcome and succeed in ways that God needs them to succeed. But there will be challenges along the way. Each one of these pieces of the block fills opposition. As one of the pastors of this church this past couple of years, I've seen a lot of areas where we've had to overcome challenges to be where we are in this moment today. Two years ago, we were doing services in the parking lot and filming them online and posting them online. Even a year ago, we still weren't sure what the next six months were going to look like. We've had to overcome a lot as a church. There's been a lot of opposition out there, but yet what we do is that we continue to press on with the help of God. And you see, I like the response of Nehemiah here. Nehemiah being a godly man in these passages, a lot of times you'll hear that he's praying. He's praying. And so when you read the passage and go into this verse, you have to pause and be like, oh, wait a minute, this is Nehemiah's response to their criticisms. So in verse 4, when it starts out, Hear, O our God, 
for we are despised, turn their taunt back on their own heads and give them over as plunder in a land of captivity. Do not cover their guilt. Do not let their sins be blotted out from your sight, for they have raged against the builders. He goes to prayer. He goes to prayer. He doesn't sit there and tell them, ah, you're wrong. You're wrong. No, I'm right. He doesn't go to fight them. He goes to prayer. When he faces opposition, he goes to prayer, asks for God's help in the moment, seeks his wisdom to give him the energy and the strength to power through. He goes to God in prayer. And I think for a lot of us, when we face opposition, we either do two things. One, we, we run, we give up. Or two, we power through on our own might. You know, they say, oh, I, I can do this. I, I, I got this. I, I know what to do next. But we very rarely will turn to God and pray and seek his guidance and his help first. I'm the world's worst. If something, there's a problem here at the church, I pop up and like, let's go to it. Let's go take care of this. Let's go take care of that. Let's come up with a plan and let's do it. But then I have to check myself, depending on what the situation is, did I first seek God's help in taking care of this plan? You know, when it comes to getting things done, if you want something done, I'll get it done. But my challenge for me is first I got to check with God to see how he wants it done. And I think for us, when we face opposition, either we cut and run, we give up too easily, or we think we can do it ourselves. But that's not how we're created. We are created as God's creation, so we go to God first. We are created for each other in relationships, so we lean on other godly people as well. That is God's gift to us. And when you combine the two, then you can overcome any opposition. Because let me tell you, as I said earlier, as you begin to step out of your routines and do something for God as an individual or a church, there will be opposition. The enemy is waiting I think many of us don't want to think there's actually spiritual warfare out there, but there is. And the church has to acknowledge it and not stick its head in the sand and act like it's not there. And the way that you combat spiritual warfare, one of the ways is staying in constant prayer with God. And so when we look at Nehemiah, I think we learn a lot from what he does when he comes across challenges. And one of the first things he always does is he goes to God in prayer. And I think that's one of the biggest lessons we can learn from this. Because with opposition, with opposition, either you can overcome it with the help of God or you can fail. And so I think today when we do sometimes go out and we try and we try, you know, and we fail at times. And when we fail, we have to look at why we failed. Was it because it's something that I didn't do correctly? Was it something outside of my control? You know, a quote from Walt Disney about opposition and adversity. He said, all the adversity I've had in my life, all of my troubles and obstacles, they've strengthened me. And you may not realize it when it happens, but a kick, a kick in the teeth may be the best thing in the world for you sometimes. You know, when we go out and we fail, I think you can learn sometimes more from that. And I think you take those moments and you dig deep in why you failed. And if it was something you were trying to do for God or something trying to do to better yourself or better the society and you failed, I bet you didn't check with God first. Maybe he didn't need you to build that wall. That was somebody else's job, but he needed you to do this instead. As a former teacher, I tried to encourage my students. I said, sometimes you can learn more from your failures. That can be a bigger motivator than getting straight A's sometimes. And I've seen it. I've seen that straight A student one time kind of just halfway do a project and get a grade that they're not used to getting, and that was the biggest motivator, and they never would have done that again. So we have to look at it, too. When we, when we do things and we fail, why did we fail? Why did we fail? Was it because of the opposition or was it because of me? And that I didn't check with God first. And I didn't seek his will for what we got going on. You know, and one of the biggest things that we can have as assurance is that in whatever we do in life, whatever we do, that God's grace is there for us. In just a moment, we'll be taking communion. 
And communion symbolizes and means so many things for Christians. But one there is that it is the, it is the representation of God's grace there in those elements given to us because we are so loved. That as the creation of God, he did not turn his back on us, but gave us Jesus Christ. And we're able to connect in that moment of the Last Supper and the grace given to all by taking communion. And so when we face opposition, when we face these challenges, know that you're not alone. Know that the creator of the whole entire world is right there with you, cheering you on. Needing for you to lean on him instead of other things that are of this world. And so the message today, when you boil it down to all this, is that we have a God that wants to be in relationship with us. A God that wants us to know we are loved and a God that wants to feel loved by his creation and so may through this week may we reflect on ways that we could connect more to God go to him in prayer see what he is calling you to do be prepared for opposition and if you fail see why you failed because prayer realigns you to his will in that moment So may we celebrate in that and may we all join and be one with that message of God's love. Let us pray.